Welcome to the Come to Your Senses podcast. I'm your host, Mary Lofgren. Here we explore how to live bravely and beautifully through pleasure, mindfulness, embodiment, femininity, beauty, art, and of course, everyday sensuality. Hello, friends, and welcome to Come to Your Senses. I am thrilled to be here with you today to talk to you about a topic that I could just nerd out on into infinity. It's really the topic I'm probably most passionate about in my life right now. And that topic is creating greater intimacy in your life by expanding your emotional intelligence through interpreting the sensations in your body. So I know that was a bit of a mouthful, but have you ever been moved to tears by one of your favorite songs? Or have you ever been standing in the kitchen and Whitney Houston comes on the radio and you just have to get up and dance and all of a sudden your feet are moving and you don't even know what's happened? Have you ever been sitting in a circle and someone says something that resonates is really truthful for you and you moan or your body gives you this little zing? So these are all different ways in which the body communicates its wisdom through sensation. Now, similarly, have you ever been in a conversation with someone And you feel confronted and all of a sudden your body just starts to shut down and you lose your voice. Have you ever held back on taking a risk that you knew you wanted to take, but it was just too scary and too uncomfortable and felt like too much for your system? Have you ever felt anger well up inside of you and thought, well, I'm going to listen to my body and I'm just really going to give it to this person. And it may have felt really good in the moment, but you're left with an emotional hangover after causing that person a lot of harm. So these are all examples, the first and the second set of examples of our emotional intelligence. And another way to say emotional intelligence is our ability to feel our feelings, but not be controlled by our feelings. So this ability to recognize, oh, I'm feeling anger, or I'm feeling sad, or I'm feeling grief, or I'm feeling joy, or I'm feeling ecstasy. And to take in that information as intelligence, rather than allowing that feeling to mindlessly control your behavior through impulse. Another way of saying it would be acting from truth rather than from trigger. And so in the language of the body, something that's important for you to know is that expression and sensation is really your language of origin. If you think about a baby and a child, that is how we first learn how to express our needs, how to know whether or not something or someone is safe, Our sensory sensitivity is a very complex and intelligent system. And over time, as we grow up, we go to schools and we go to churches and we go to offices where we're taught to ignore and override the sensations and the messages of the body in favor of creating a civilized order, right? So I remember being a kid and, you know, having to pee in third grade, but there was no way Sister Nicholas, the very staunch, strict nun, was going to allow me to pee if it wasn't time to take a break. And so I just told my bladder, sorry, sweetheart, but it's just not going to happen. And over time, over decades of retraining and domesticating that instinctual self, It can feel so confusing because it's almost like being raised in a home where you learn one language and then going to a school where you are taught another language and then 
you get reintroduced to your original language, it's like it's there, but you can't quite say anything or understand anything other than hello and please and thank you. And so today on the podcast, this is going to be like taking an advanced level language class where you learn how to take those basic building blocks and start to form sentences. I'm going to share ways that you can begin to create a rapport with the sensations of your body to better understand what they're trying to express so you can have better intimacy with yourself, better intimacy with your relationships, make more empowered choices in your life based on your truth rather than your triggers, and have less of a tendency to act from your adorable, darling, self-preserving ego and more of a tendency to act from what some might call the spirit or the higher self or the soul. So I want to begin with an exercise. I want you to start by just checking in with yourself and notice how you're feeling. How are you feeling emotionally right now? Checking in and choosing one or two words to describe an emotion that you're feeling in this moment. And then taking it a level deeper and asking yourself the question, how do I know that's what I'm feeling? And zeroing in on the sensations of your body and how those sensations articulate what you're feeling. So when I'm feeling sad, I feel this soggy feeling in my heart, like my heart is like a soggy piece of bread. When I'm feeling depressed, I feel like there's a dense gray rain cloud that's just sitting on top of me all the time. When I feel happy and free, I feel a spaciousness in my chest and I feel a relaxation around my eyes and around my head and in my shoulders. And so this is one good example of the way that how our system articulates emotion is through sensation. And I want to say that you may have done that exercise and thought, I feel nothing. I don't know what I'm feeling. People ask me that question all the time. How are you feeling? How are you? And I just have no idea. And that's okay. And I'm going to give you some tools around that in this time together today. And so before we go into these six ways that you can expand your emotional intelligence through the sensations of your body, I want to share a story with you about a friend of mine. Well, actually, where the story begins is with butter. (laughs) So I love butter. I mean, is there just nothing better than a big old slab of Kerrygold Irish butter on top of a morning glory muffin? I tell you. I love butter on pasta, I love it on lobster, I love it on muffins, I love it on croissants. And I have a friend who really hates butter. And when we would have dinner together, if I made something with butter, he couldn't even stomach it, wouldn't even put it on a potato. And this was so mysterious to me. And one day, and I I have his permission to share this story, one day he opened up and shared that as a child, he had a very abusive babysitter who used to feed him butter sandwiches. And so his system now associates the taste of butter with that very negative experience. And I think this is just such a powerful example of the way that all of us have these different systems of wiring and what determines our preferences often has very little to do with the item or the food or the person, but it's the way that our system is wired to interpret that trigger and provides us with information about it in the form of sensation. You know, this is why we call it intelligence, right? So if you think about the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency here in the United States, their job is to collect information. 
and I, I want to preface this by saying I'm basing this knowledge off of watching the Showtime series Homeland. So there are field agents who gather the information, and then there are analysts who determine and analyze what does this information mean, and is it a threat? And with your body and your nervous system, it's like your nervous system's response to butter, for example, is giving you information, intelligence in the form of sensation. And so if I'm in a confronting conversation with someone, it helps me to know that it's not this person that's causing me to have this feeling of shutdown or my throat closing up or my temper rising and feeling like I just want to explode all over this person. It's, it's not even the emotion that this person is evoking. It's the sensation that's happening in my body that's causing my instincts and my impulses to become aroused. And so how do we learn to work with these sensations rather than working for them? How do we take this instinctual knowledge that the body is providing and rather than simply obeying the impulse to keep repeating the same patterns over and over again, consciously be with those sensations to allow them to evolve into their true intention, which is wisdom. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about right now is six ways to work with the sensations of your body to expand your emotional intelligence. So number one is a mantra that I recommend adopting when you are interfacing with emotions, when you are in difficult conversations, facing a difficult life choice. And that is curiosity over criticism. Curiosity over criticism is a way of communicating with others or with the self in a way that possesses a neutral charge. So for example, Criticism, whether it's good or bad, depending on the situation, you know, we we have movie critics and theater critics for a reason. They serve a purpose. Criticism contains a heavy charge. So if we were looking at this on a scientific level, anything you place in the presence of something that contains a strong charge, that thing will either defend itself against what you've placed it inside of or it will adapt to meet the needs of that stronger charged thing. (laughs) Very scientific term there. Same thing goes for the positive. You know, and if you've ever had someone, I, I play this game with my mom a lot, where I ask her opinion on something, and if she tries to convince me to do it, I'm like, well, no, I don't, I don't know. But if she's telling me not to do it, I'm like, mom! This is why I should do it. You know, it's this funny game of push-pull. Curiosity, on the other hand, is neutral. Curiosity contains a neutral charge. And so whatever you place inside the container of curiosity is not going to conform, adapt, or defend. It's simply going to become more of what it truly is. Curiosity takes the more... Robert Redford, Kristen Scott Thomas in the Horse Whisperer approach. If you haven't seen that movie, it's one of my favorite movies. And in that movie, they take, you know, this isn't really a spoiler alert, but maybe if you are super sensitive to spoilers, they take a very traumatized horse who's seen a number of different therapists to try to get him back to baseline. Nobody can do it. So they bring him to Robert Redford's character in the plains of Montana, and he works with the horse. And the way that he works with the horse is he just enters the ring with the horse and gets him to trust him. Doesn't put him on a lead line, 
doesn't do anything until that horse becomes curious about the trainer rather than the trainer trying to dominate. The horse begins to trust the trainer and become curious about the trainer and therefore they have a working relationship. And similarly, as humans, we have this very unique ability and opportunity to bring the sacred curious witness on board when it comes to our emotions. So when my dog Winnie is feeling jealous of another dog, if I'm petting another dog, she doesn't have that filter of self-curiosity to say, okay, Winnie, you're feeling jealous right now. Let's stay over here and work with it. She just runs over and shoves her own head underneath my hand to cope with that feeling and the emotion that she's feeling. As human beings, we have this really unique, almost superpower of being able to witness sensation and emotion and watch it rather than become possessed by it. Now, this is a skill. This is not a default ability. This is something that definitely needs to be honed over time. And as I share some of these other tools with you, encoded in these tools are ways that you can bring that sacred witness on board. But I'll just say that one of the ways, one of the most powerful ways that I know of to bring that witness on board is to just pause and say, you know, hang on, I just need to check in with myself. I do this a lot when I'm teaching or when I'm doing a group coaching session. If I notice that my mind is moving faster than my heart, you know, hang on, I just need to take a pause. I just need to check in with myself. And I do a scan. What's going on in my body? What's going on in my heart, in my belly, in my mind? And just that momentary pause of being able to watch allows all of my systems to recalibrate and reharmonize so that I'm speaking from my most authentic place. A story to describe that is recently I was doing a group coaching call for my membership and on the call, my phone was in the other room and it dinged during the call and everybody could hear it. And I was so ashamed. (laughs) You know, I just noticed after lots and lots and lots of practice with witnessing and observing my emotions and my feelings and sensations, I heard the ding. I felt the squeeze inside my chest. And what's really interesting about this process is not just observing and getting curious about the sensations but getting curious about the thoughts that are a product of that sensation. So when my phone dinged, I felt that squeeze in my heart and I noticed the thought pop up, you're such a fraud. You're never going to get anywhere in this life. How unprofessional that you forget to turn off your phone I bet so-and-so who I obsessively look at on Instagram and compete with in my mind doesn't leave their phone on during their coaching Q&A calls, you know? And I just was like, wow, wow, how impressive that closed loop system of sensation leading to thought, thought then leading to sensation. And the impulse again in these moments is to fix, stop thinking that. Stop beating me up from the inside. And notice how as I say that, my voice has a very specific charge, a very specific outcome it wants to see, which is stop. And yet, curiosity over criticism. What actually stops that voice is saying, oh, huh, listen to that. And when I can take the curious approach, it is no longer my voice. It's not personal. It's a voice that was encoded and developed to protect my survival, just like my friend's voice that says, hey, buddy, stay away from butter for the rest of your life. So tool number two is to expand your vocabulary of sensational words, warm, throbbing, expansive, achy, soggy tender, 
silky, released, tense, heavy, tight, tingly. These are all words that help to articulate the physicality of what may be going on in your body that is a product of your emotions. If you go to schoolofsensualliving.com slash intelligence, which is the URL for this episode, you can click on a link and actually download a beautiful PDF of over 25 different sensational words to begin to describe those sensations in your body to better interpret the intelligence of your system. Number three is listening carefully to the tone, the pitch, and the speed of your thoughts. So we all know the phrase, it's not what we do, it's how we do it. Similarly, it's not what our mind is saying. What's more important is how it's saying it. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you're in a friendship and you really want your friend to change. (laughs) But you know that we can't change people. And so your mind says, you know you can't change her. That's one example. Example B is, you can't change her. Do you notice how different the tone, the pitch, and the speed are in those two sentences? And how the first is most likely coming from what some might call my higher self, my wisdom body, the part of me that knows what I can change and what I can't, and has a curious, compassionate understanding of that information. The second sounds a bit more like it's coming from the part of me that wants to desperately cling to and control my life and my relationships so that I can be okay. Another great example is, you better pick up the dry cleaning today, versus, oh, I need to pick up the dry cleaning today. Same message, completely different tone and pitch and speed. And so a way to expand that intelligence is to listen not just to what's being said, but to listen to who exactly in the mind is saying it. Is it my wisdom that's saying it? Is it my fear that's saying it? Again, curiosity over criticism as you listen deeply, not just to what's being said, but how it's being said in your thoughts. Tool number four is to create a practice of turning towards your feelings. And so you hear a lot these days Feel your feelings, which is great advice. But what is the difference between dwelling in your self-pity and depression and actually turning towards and facing what you feel? And I've heard it said that the difference between depression and sadness is that depression makes us numb. I think it was Elizabeth Gilbert who said, In depression, I can't feel anything. When I'm sad, that's a very active, sensational feeling. That's when I feel really alive. That's why I feel really attuned to my human experience. And so dwelling, in my experience anyway, involves a lot of self-blame. It usually involves a lot of acting out the feeling where I'm feeling my feelings, I'm feeling my feelings, and now all of a sudden I feel like I need to eat something or drink something or buy something to help modulate the intensity of this feeling. And overall, it just kind of feels awful. You know, it feels like having a backpack that's full of rocks that I just can't seem to take off. Turning towards our feelings, however, and feeling our feelings, I find is a much more active, much more pleasurable, in many cases, experience. And I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I was on the phone with my money coach, Barbara Husson, formerly known as Barbara Stanny, and I was experiencing some 
trouble financially. And I was told the whole situation to Barbara and I sat there pen poised, ready to take her advice, start a spreadsheet, track my expenses, whatever it is. And Barbara is one of the wisest people I know and one of the best listeners that I know. And she said to me, Mary, if you want to start your spreadsheet, you go right ahead. But I want you to know that when I listen to you, I don't hear money problems. What I hear is a lot of unfelt pain. Ouch. (laughs) I was confounded. You know, I mean, I, I wanted a mathematical solution to my problem. I wanted steps. I was ready. And her instruction was to grab a chair and put it next to the window. And when I feel uncomfortable feelings, to just go sit in that chair, look out the window, and feel. And I think I probably... Uh, you know, maybe threw my pen and book across the room or something like that. And it took me several weeks to take her advice. And I kept running into the same problems around money, wouldn't you know? And one night, as I felt this pain that I had been numbing through spending, brush its tentacles against my skin, I said, okay. And I sat down and I set a timer for 10 minutes and I felt what I had been running from. And at first, it felt like my mind was a passenger on the Titanic, desperately scrambling to get into a lifeboat and escape this situation. But as I allowed the timer to count down and just stayed with the feeling, this liquid sense of calm settled over my body Because I could finally put down the effort of running. I had no idea that 90% of the exhaustion that I felt around that pain had nothing to do with the pain itself. It had to do with the running. And so my experience of feeling my feelings is that even though it can be extremely uncomfortable, there's always a relief a liquid calm that comes when I can just finally stop running. And so some practices that I do around feeling my feelings are setting a timer for 10 minutes and just just going to sit here and I'm going to feel and I'm going to bring curiosity on board and I'm just going to allow these sensations and these feelings to come through. And I will say that whenever I do that, There is always wisdom when I stand up. Even if it's just a kernel of wisdom, there's always some wisdom that's revealed. Another thing that I'll do is I'll turn on a song that feels like the feeling that I have inside. So it doesn't really matter what the lyrics are. It doesn't matter what the artist is. If it feels feels like that feeling inside, I turn it on and I just allow my body to move and to respond. That exercise is inspired by Koya, which is a movement class that I practice that has taught me so much about my feelings and my sensuality and my body. The third is creating a container where you can feel your feelings and open the container lid, and also close the container lid when you're done. So I learned this from my therapist, that when it comes to feeling your feelings, a lot of times, you know, there's, there's a very good reason why we run from uncomfortable feelings. And if you sit and feel your feelings for five or 10 minutes, and then you try to go on about your day and you're feeling some really intense grief, well, that can really mess with your whole day. And so something that I do is I will set a timer and I'll say, okay, grief, you and me. And maybe I will make art during those 10 minutes to articulate what I'm feeling. Maybe I'll turn on a song and move. Maybe I'll just sit and feel. And then after that 10 minutes, I have a visualization of a canister where I'm taking the grief or the sadness or the discomfort, whatever it is, put it inside that cylinder 
I imagine the lid being placed on it and I say, okay, our next date is in six hours or our next date is in 24 hours from now. And then as I go on about my day, even if those intrusive feelings of grief come in, because I know that there's a predetermined time in the future in which I'm going to set aside time to feel it no matter what's going on, the grief is less likely to pull at the hem of my skirt and constantly need my attention. That was something that I really practiced after my dad passed away in a a very sudden bicycle accident. And so these first four tools were a little more geared towards uncomfortable sensations and emotions. And these last two tools are going to be tools to help distill and expand positive feelings and emotions. And so the fifth tool is to begin to keep a journal of what makes your body zing. And not just when do we zing on what we like, but when do we zing on what breaks our heart? So I zing every time I see police brutality. I also zing every time I read about transformative justice and reparations. Those things strike me as truthful and good. And paying attention to that sensation of zing or yes or no is a way to, again, find out who you really are beneath what you've been groomed to believe. And I'm not a big vision boarder. I find them kind of annoying, but I do love using art and imagery to affect a change in my life. And one exercise that really helped me had to do with a vision, kind of a vision board. When I was working in corporate America and really depressed, like dangerously depressed and didn't know what my next move was, one of the things that gave me really powerful direction as to what to do next was creating a vision board of women who I admired, who had that thing that I wanted. So what I saw in each of these women was a level of freedom and creative expression that I felt like was being systematically drained out of my body every time I went into my office. And so I created this vision board with images of all of them all over the vision board. And the word that resonated as the common trait among them was boldness. And I typed on my computer the word bold in the most giant font that I could create, printed it out in purple, and I just put right in the center of that vision board, bold, with an exclamation point. Wouldn't you know, two months later, I was out of that corporate job. I was working at a personal assistant job at the time while I figured out my next step. And then a few months after that, I landed my absolute top tier dream job where my creative self was not only accepted, but required. And all of that, I believe, came about by really noticing, oh, that feels bold. Oh, she was just bold. Oh, that person strikes me as bold and surrounding myself because my body zinged on bold. And it was my boldness that got me that dream job. And tool number six is specifically for when you find yourself in that experience of dwelling, where you just feel consumed by your emotion and you can't break free. It's to experiment with changing a thought to change the sensation in the body. So we talked a little bit about how the emotions and the sensations and the thoughts in our mind are a closed loop system. So when I described the experience of my phone dinging off, it created a sensation in my body, which then created a thought in my mind. My thought in my mind, you're a fraud, created more of a sensation in my body And they were just ping, 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 setting each other off until I stopped the scenario through my curiosity. After 
the very necessary intervention of curiosity, a way to redirect that neural impulse is to change your thought to have a different sensation. So for example, in that moment, you're a fraud, you're not going anywhere. I notice that when I think that thought, oh, it feels like I just want to crawl into a hole and hide there for the rest of my life. But if I change the thought to, I'm a human being and mistakes are part of success. I am going amazing places and I get to take all of myself with me as I go. Wow. Just by saying that, I feel a lightness. I feel like this tunnel that I was just in a moment ago, thinking that I wasn't going anywhere, all of a sudden has a pinprick of light and that light is getting stronger as I realize I'm a human being. Let's keep going. And so the sensation in my body changes as a result of me changing the thought. And then the thought changes the sensation in the body. Now, an important thing to know about all of this is that the origin point for being able to change the thought is curiosity. So without curiosity, I'm having a negative thought and then I just swing the pendulum into a positive thought. My system probably isn't really going to believe that positive thought because it's been such a fast and rapid shift. Curiosity and noticing the negative thought gives my system a little place to rest in the middle to get its bearings and then to form a positive thought that's based in truth rather than just a way to rebel against the negative thought. So my loves, to tie a bow on the pretty brown paper package of this podcast, those six tools we looked at today are Curiosity over criticism, expanding your sensational vocabulary, listening to the tone, pitch, and speed of your thoughts, turning towards rather than dwelling in your feelings, keeping a journal of what you zing on, and finally changing the thought to change the sensation and emotion. If you found this podcast useful, please let me know in the review on iTunes. I would love to hear from you and get to know you. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time. For more tools, inspiration, and community in the art of sensual living, head over to schoolofsensualliving.com. There you'll find a free course in how to embody genuine confidence through the secrets of powerful feminine body language. Go to schoolofsensualliving.com confidence to check it out today.